Thank you, everyone, for uh, coming out this evening to tonight's event on slavery, capitalism, and the making of the modern world. Uh, my name is Zach Sell. I'm a visiting research scholar at the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice and also a visiting faculty fellow at the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity to introduce and participate in tonight's Sawyer Seminar on Slavery, Capitalism, and the Making of the Modern World, uh, co-sponsored by the Watson Institute, the Initiative on Race and Indigeneity, the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, and the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice. So as a visitor at CSSJ, I can say that events like this are really essential to the work that the center does and its dedication to investigating the history of slavery and its legacy. So tonight's seminar with Jennifer Morgan, Seth Rockman, uh, Anthony Bogues, and Walter Johnson, I think features scholars who have together in different ways fundamentally transformed the way that the relationship between slavery and capitalism is considered and understood. Uh, moving our understanding away from a debate about whether and to what extent slavery is a part of capitalism and toward a demand for understanding how racial slavery structured capitalism. I think this shift has also enabled really a deeper understanding of the continuing presence of slavery's imprint upon post-slavery capitalism. So I think uh, to appreciate just how firmly embedded the idea of a debate about slavery and capitalism is, one could look at the long shelves of books dedicated to the subject that have been published really since the 19th century. But I think rather than really drag everyone again through the twists and turns and contours of that debate, I wanted to instead just note one minor uh, moment in 1955 that I think is a moment when that really also enables greater appreciation of the significance of seminars like the one we're having tonight. So that, this moment is preserved actually in the papers of W.E.B. Du Bois. In a short letter, Du Bois wrote to Eugene Genovese about the latter's master's thesis, uh, Plantation Slavery, Its Unprofitability, and Its Relationship to Capitalism. Du Bois noted that he hardly had time to offer any criticism of the work because he was busy, but, <laughs> but even as such, he could see the absence of any consideration of the internal slave trade cent centrality in US capitalism and also noticed that Genovese, Genovese did not engage in any serious way with Marx's writing. Uh, the implication of Du Bois' response uh, was that both historically and conceptually, Genovese's approach was offering very little. So if a person didn't know better, one might assume Genovese ultimately didn't receive the letter. He would go on to become perhaps the leading voice in 20th century discussions over the non-capitalist nature of US slavery uh, and really disregarded this advice. And I think you know, from one perspective, this is really perhaps an unremarkable moment in that so-called debate about slavery and capitalism. But from another perspective, I think there's something in and within that ignorance that can enable better appreciation of events like tonight's seminar. Well, Genovese's work enabled a long line of historians to create and debate a question, Du Bois's writing demanded a different mode of critiquing capitalism through understanding of slavery and its history and black emancipation in the US. Particularly in Black Reconstruction, Du Bois demanded a rethinking of concepts and history grounded in the realities of slavery, which forced also a critical insight about the present. And I think it's that latter engagement, uh, rather than the former, that makes seminars like tonight's so important. And I think in, in very different ways, uh, all of our panelists are working in critical relation to that latter uh, tradition. So um, I'm going to just very briefly introduce all of the panelists at once so we can uh, get right into both presentations and conversation. And basically, the structure of tonight's event is, I think, everyone will present for about 15 minutes, um, and then we'll have a bit of a conversation between the panelists and then open up uh, the panel to, or open up the room to broader conversation. Uh, so Jennifer Morgan is professor of history in the Department of Social and Cultural Analysis at New York University, where she also serves as chair. Uh, she's the author of Laboring Women, Gender and Reproduction in the Making of New World Slavery, and her most recent published work includes Accounting for the Most Excruciating Torment, Transatlantic Passages. Uh, she is currently at work on a project that considers colonial numeracy, racism, and the rise of the tra transatlantic slave trade in the 17th century English Atlantic world. Seth Rockman is associate professor here of history here at Brown. Uh, his 2009 book, Scraping By, Wage Labor, Slavery, and Survival in Early Baltimore, received multiple prizes, including the Philip Taft Labor History Book Award. 
He's most recently published Negro Cloth, Mastering the Market for Slave Clothing in Antebellum America, which was in the uh, edited volume, American Capitalism. And uh, uh, Seth and Sven Beckert have uh, recently also co-edited Slavery's Capitalism, A New History of American Economic Development. Uh, Tony Bogues, uh, probably most people in the room n have taken his classes, know him in some way, but is uh, director of the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice. He's <laughs> author of uh, Kelly Ben's Freedom, The Early Political Thought of C.L.R. James, Black Heretics and Black Prophets, and he's also the editor of several volumes, including After Man, Towards the Human, uh, Critical Essays on Sylvia Winter. And right now, he is a visiting research fellow at the International Institute of Social History in Amsterdam. So, and Last, uh, Walter Johnson is Winthrop Professor of History uh, at Harvard and author of Soul by Soul, uh, Life Inside the Antebellum Slave Market, and also River of Dark Dreams, Slavery and Empire in the Mississippi Valley's Cotton Kingdom. He's currently writing a history of the city of St. Louis, from Lewis and Clark to Michael Brown. Uh, Johnson is also a founding member of the Commonwealth Project, which joins academics and activists in an effort to create a community-controlled art space in the third ward of St. Louis. Um, and so I think with that, we'll begin with Jennifer, if I'm not Thank mistaken. You. <laughs> Should we? Are you guys going to use the podium? Or? I am, because I'm going to put some images up. OK. <laughs> I, think, I think I'm going to go ahead and just um, stay seated, if that's OK with everybody. Is that all right? OK. Um, so first of all, thank you uh, for the invitation to be part of this conversation. Um, I'm going to just talk through some ideas that I have, um, and I really look forward to, to unpacking them together with my fellow panelists. Um, so at the risk of, of, uh, of oversimplifying, I want to start by saying that race and racism make us lazy thinkers. Um, they stand in for careful consideration of processes and offer up simple explanations for complex and foundational historic phenomenon. We live in a moment when we simply cannot fathom an encounter between an African and a European descendant person unsaturated by racial recognition or racial hierarchy. The longstanding work of scholars to explain or to understand the development of um, transatlantic slavery seems forever constricted by the terms of the discussion, which, again, to oh, forgive me for the oversimplification, is was the trade in slaves economically rational or was it racist? We fail to see the ways in which both economic rationality and racial hierarchy come into sharp relief at the same time, that the two processes are interwoven, and that as a result, the way that the question has long been framed leaves crucial aspects not just unanswered but unasked. The afterlife of slavery has saturated not just our imaginations but indeed our disciplines um, and our methodological stance in relationship to the archive. I'm thinking, for example, of something I recently encountered that straddles the relationship between um, slavery, political economy, and culture in a way that I found uh, illuminating. When the Portuguese first arrived in Western Africa in the 15th century, both on Cape Verde and then onto the coast, their desire for trade was facilitated by alliances between them and local traders, often um, alliances that were cemented through marriage. Such relationships and the children born of them have mostly been understood by African historians as evidence that stands in the way of European, a European propensity for racialist thinking. And therefore, by extension, it stands, in, it, it stands as evidence that the Portuguese didn't rush into their future as slave traders. We find it difficult, or at least I find it difficult, to see the intimacy of marriage between an, a European man and an African woman on the coast of West Africa as not I think there are too many negatives in this sentence, but as not functioning as a bulwark against the trade in slaves. We fail to register or to fully um, explore, to work out how to articulate the ways in which the economic dimensions of what would become hereditary racial slavery produced ways of thinking that make economies and polities on the West African coast difficult to understand as such. In other words, the, the example of those marriages gets uh, put on the side of culture, the production of culture or the production of ideas about race, rather than seeing those things as embedded in these, these early um, <laughs> economic formations and as evidence of political economy at work as well as, um, as polities at work. Um, somehow we also fail to see how women on the coast, 
uh, whose vulnerability to capture and transport began to encroach on a previous possibility of strategic and possibly affective alliances could be the route through which we as scholars can see a process unfolding as they did, the way that we can see the intimacies of race, trade, and what would become hereditary racial slavery. Even when we emphasize the long duration of the transatlantic slave trade, the 400 years, we end up inadvertently turning it into a single episode in time. The particulars of the trade are flattened even as we attempt to convey the impact of its long duration. Um, this idea that this is again an example of the way that race, I think, makes us um, lazy thinkers. Um, and it's related to the concern that Vince Brown has expressed um, regarding the notion of the condition of slavery. Um, that the term condition, the condition of being enslaved, the condition of slavery, inadvertently produces stasis. Um, in its place, he offers us the phrase, the predicament of enslavement. How do we understand the predicament of enslavement? My strong conviction is that by breaking down the period of Atlantic slavery into clearly understood and demarcated periods of time, we will be in a much better position to understand its predicaments. And by doing so in the early modern period, as I am gesturing towards here, and, oh, excuse me, in a very shorthanded way, uh, that was quite a gesture, <laughs> gesturing towards here, um, uh, by doing so, uh, the particularities of those predicaments will shed crucial light on what has fundamentally been um, a quite successful project of, of naturalizing both the connection between slavery and race and obfuscating the connection between slavery and capitalism. Um, we have so fully inherited the narratives of slavery and the slave trade crafted for us by 18th century abolitionists that I think that we sometimes don't always understand the ways in which slavery and the slave trade were deeply embedded in the emergence of late medieval and early modern notions of trade, of value, of exchange, of currency, and ultimately of the relationship between population, the accumulation of wealth, and the nation state, all of which comprise early modern capitalism and capitalist formations. So I've been working in the late 15th and um, 16th century these days trying to think through the European and West African turn to, to the Atlantic. Um, as, uh, as vistas to the east expanded, I think a range of material and ideological technologies came into play for rulers, for merchants, for ideologues, and for travelers in both Europe and West Africa. Numeracy, um, which is my way of capturing a whole range of ideas about rationality, about numbers, about trade, about currency, um, about attention to demography. All of these were just some of the new modes of thinking that accompanied the origins of the modern Atlantic world. In England and on the West African coast, traders and scholars were reconsidering their understanding of wealth, of trade, and the ways in which states benefited um, from I, a, an idea of, of population. Uh, for English theorists, that, uh, that notion of, of counting population uh, is called political arithmetic, and it, it becomes um, demography and, and, and understanding demographic strengths and, and vulnerabilities. Um, on the African coast, uh, traders began to see populations as marketable <clears throat> in new and more fungible ways, as slavery came to mean something entirely different. And by this, I mean African traders. I mean, um, I, I, I don't mean European traders who are on the coast. Um, and uh, as slavery came to mean something entirely different and was premised on an unspoken idea that population was somehow infinite. Um, simultaneously, the language of race and racial hierarchy shifted long-standing concepts of who was different, who was foreign, who was an ally, who was an enemy, and emerged to shape the trade in slavery, in the goods produced by slave labor, and in the settler colonialism that would come to comprise the core means by which wealth was transferred across and around the Atlantic. So both numeracy and race thinking shaped and were shaped by the social and cultural processes that attended their use. Neither are fixed or static tools, but together they forged rationalized meaning through the interplay between the supposed logic of calculus and the alchemy of race making. And this is all, uh, this is all a lot of shorthand, which I'm happy to talk about a little bit more. Um, my main, the, 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 where am I here? Okay. Um, Historians have long agreed that the economic transformations of the late 16th and the early 17th century were accompanied by new symbolic meanings that far exceeded the economy, but somehow that understanding stops um, sort of inside of Europe and uh, doesn't, um, doesn't 
doesn't include slavery. I mean, um, the most imp our most fun foundational uh, theorists of early histories of capitalism. I mean, think about uh, Brodel, for example, who, as he introduces the concept of the labor market, says in a kind of parenthesis, he says that he as Marx did, quote, will leave aside the classic case of slavery, which was, however, to be prolonged and even renewed. And, and this gesture of saying, like, yes, slavery, but I'm not going to talk about it because I'm talking about Europe, is really the groundwork on which, um, on which many revisionists stand. So um, new ways of thinking were the norm in 17th century England, which is where I'm per, you know, working right now. Um, and contemporary observers uh, understood that significant shifts were underway regarding the role of merchants and traders in producing the wealth of monarchies and states. They were careful and assiduous to, in, in trying to explain these new ways of thinking. Um, 17th century English policy around trade and commerce reflected a crucial moment in the development of Atlantic markets. And it was at this moment that foundational commitments to an empire ro rooted in colonial commodities markets and dependent on slave labor took hold. So we see that and we understand that if we're, th if we're reading the history of political economy. But what we don't ever do, or what we rarely do, is think about the experience of those people who are being um, transformed into commodities in this early period, not in the 18th century and the 19th century, but right at the time when it's beginning, under the, um, under the, the hands of the Portuguese and the Spanish, and then ultimately um, other European nations. And we don't turn that gaze back to think about how they are also producing, in some ways, um, uh, theories of early commodification and of early capitalism. And so that effort to try to kind of read the archive back um, on this process is is at the heart of of what I'm involved in. So, how how long have I been talking? Just a few more minutes. Okay, <laughs> I'm very close. Um, okay, so, um, I think that we need to ask questions about the way that hereditary racial slavery emerges at a moment in which all sorts of questions about population, about currency. Um, and about uh, trade and about value are circulating. They're circulating out of Europe, they're circulating on the West African coast, and they are being transformed. Um, the questions that I'm asking uh, are clearly related to and in dialogue with the newly invigorated scholarship on capitalism and slavery that has followed Eric Williams' foundational work and that is exemplified by the crucial work of my fellow panelists. I think, though, that I'm asking a slightly different set of questions as I come to this not from the perspective of a scholar of capitalism but rather as a scholar of gendered power and of racialized intimacy. It's this location that shapes my interest less in the structural relationship between slavery and capitalism and more with, an emergent, cult with emergent cultural practices in which the fungibility of humans and the growth of early modern slave societies is rendered logical because it's in that logic, um, it is that logic that hides the subjects that I'm most interested in understanding and therefore um, as I grapple with the archive that's available to me, it's the process of rendering questions unanswerable that is most crucial to my work. And so, um, so for me, what is the most important thing about the intersection between slavery and capitalism in the early modern period is the way that it transforms certain subjects into, into uh, uh, marginalia. Um, so, so the subjects that, and, and by subjects I mean uh, intellectual subjects, but also the people, so that those women whose bodies are producing hereditary racial slavery and whose bodies are the site of law and theory and um, new power relations are then erased from our archive in ways that everybody in this room is 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 intimately familiar with, um, but that are ways that we um, we still really need to continue to focus on. So I will stop there. Thank you. I'm going to stand because I'm going to show a couple of images here. Um, so it might take a minute to put down the screen. Uh, while that's happening, uh, let me just say there are a couple of chairs. There's one here, there's one here. If people are looking. Uh... Yes. All right. How about that? All right, great. Uh, there are uh, there's some chairs here. There's a chair here. For those who are, who are standing who'd like to, to sit down, you're welcome to do so.
There are not a lot of them, and I'm, so, I'm sorry to my fellow panelists for, for sticking you with, with, with this. Uh, what a treat to be here. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, to be on a panel with some of my favorite uh, scholars is really uh, something that, that's quite special. One of the things that I like so much about the conversation that's emerged about the relationship of slavery and capitalism uh, is that it's taking place on so many different scales. It can be done uh, sort of on massive macroeconomic terms, looking at uh, processes of growth and development over hundreds of years, looking at data sets that run centuries. Uh, it can be done by looking at very small technologies, uh, things like the account book, for instance. Uh, it can be done uh, by zooming in on particular places, connecting the global and the local. Uh, and the work that I've been trying to do is trying to take this perhaps to some of the most quotidian and small spaces possible. And from uh, a very, very precise location, expand and imagine outward the ways in which slavery and capitalism are connected to one another uh, in the decades between the American Revolution and the Civil War. So the place that I want to start uh, is with a list. So when Mary Rodman sat down to sew frocks in 1840, she consulted this list of dimensions. The first frock was for someone who stood 4'11 and measured, measured 38 inches around the waist. The next frock would have to be longer, about 56 inches from collar to hem, in order to fit a woman 5 foot 6 inches tall. As she worked down the list, number 4, number 5, and so forth, Rodman might have contemplated the dollar a day that she earned for every six, or the dollar she earned for every six frocks. She had to remember to attach a tag with these dimensions legibly inscribed to each frock so they would get to the intended recipient. At 5'11", number three on her list was very tall for the times. Number 10 must have been a child at only four foot three. The inhabitants of these measured bodies might not have warranted a second thought for Rodman, who soon, who soon turned to another order involving not just frocks, but also shifts, the cotton undergarments worn closest to a woman's skin. Likely wearing a near identical garment under her own dress, the 13-year-old Rodman perhaps did not pause to think about number five, number six, or number seven. But this kind of sewing was tedious. And so why shouldn't Rodman's mind wander from South Kingston, Rhode Island, to the wearers of her handiwork someplace far away? Now, New England girls like Rodman and their mothers had taken in sewing for generations, whether as, parts of networks, whether as part of networks of neighborly exchange that structured rural communities, or thanks to more recent practices of merchant storekeepers and manufacturers distributing cut cloth to local families to stitch in exchange for store credits. Outwork, as it was called, had proven a particularly effective means of mobilizing the labor of wives and daughters in the countryside, and it contributed significantly to Rhode Island's industrial output. The proprietors of a local carding mill would have furnished Mary's mother, grandmother with wool roving to spin into yarn on her own wheel. And once spinning mills began producing vast quantities of yarn, Mary's mother would have accepted warp and filling to weave on a family loom. And now that weaving had been mechanized, Mary received pre-cut cloth to assemble into garments at home. Skeins of yarn, pieces of cloth, stacks of trousers were returned to the hands of the merchant or manufacturer who had furnished the initial supplies. And even at low rates, this outwork provided supplemental income to families like the Rodmans, who, particularly because they were paid in store goods, gained or maintained access to the teapots, the ribbons, and the other consumer goods that had defined middle-class respectability in the New England countryside. Take a step back. The expansive trade networks of the early modern world had long embedded the local experience of work within global systems of supply and distribution. The 19th century New England women who turned Argentine wool into textiles for Louisiana slaves followed in the footsteps of the Gujarat weavers, the, the Gongzhou porcelain decorators, and the countless other pre-industrial workers who transformed raw materials they themselves did not produce into export commodities they themselves did not use. The entangled relationship of remote producers and consumers has been a defining characteristic of modern world history, as has the ease and speed with which these connections have become routinized and, by extension, invisible. If a New Hampshire farm girl in the 1830s ever stopped in the middle of weaving or in the middle of braiding Caribbean or Caribbean palm leaves into hats for Mississippi boatmen and thought to herself, this is weird. I'm in New Hampshire. I'm palm leaves from Cuba to go on the heads of men in Mississippi. Right? She left no record of such musings for posterity. More likely, her own experience as a consumer of buttons and raisins, 
or I'll come back, uh, and other commonplace imports had so naturalized commercial interconnections as to make them unworthy of comment. School texts, for instance, the kind of school books that Mary Rodman might have looked at, like Emma Willard's Geography for Beginners, reinforced the point, reminding her that the entire world could be found on the shelves of the country store where she earned credits for the shifts and frocks that she sewed. Now, lurking behind this world of goods, then as now, were relations of power that structured work, the questions of who did it on what terms and to whose benefit. Equally in the shadows were the ideological, theological, and ethical commitments that made these patterns of production and exchange business as usual, the unarticulated and unquestioned assumptions that said it was perfectly appropriate for a 13-year-old girl to sew frocks for money, or that might have prompted that girl, Mary Rodman, to think long and hard, or to think not at all about the frocks that she was sewing. Various disruptions, of course, the hurricane that destroyed the crop, the machine that made a traditional form of labor redundant, the financial panic that obliterated commercial credit, all of these could readily reconfigure patterns of global integration. And in, they do so into locally experienced forms of insecurity to bring people face to face with truths long unstated. Taxation and military occupation, for example, had forced colonists like Mary Rodman's great-grandparents to confront their affection with to tea and textiles, as well as to assess the value of their relationship to the British Empire. Moral revolutions could also call the question as when Quaker communities at the heart of transatlantic commerce began to testify against African slavery. By the end of the 18th century, a number of Anglo-American merchants and manufacturers had concluded that trading in human beings was illegitimate commerce and that producing shackles was an immoral use of a forge. Their compatriots insisted that consumers in England and North America grapple with the remote exploitation that sweetened their tea and their cakes. The agitation leading to the abolition of the Atlantic slave trade is emblematic of how long standard, standing relationships of production and consumption can suddenly become a problem. And scholars have lavished attention on the reformulations of capitalism in this changed environment. It was here, for instance, that political economists, moral reformers, and businessmen alike imagined a liberal economy predicated on the competitive strivings of the self-owned and the self-made. Several decades on the other side of that reckoning, Mary Rodman was born into a Rhode Island where slave grown cotton was a crucial ingredient in the state's economy and where numerous families spun, wove, and sewed for plantation markets. This relationship would not attain the status of a problem for most New Englanders. Commercial entanglements occasionally garnered a comment from organized abolitionists in the 1830s and 1840s, but rarely prompted a call to close the textile mills on account of their complicity in slavery several states away. Nor could one hear public defamations of girls like Mary Rodman, whose sewing was in the service of a Mississippi plantation 1,500 miles away. Although Rhode Island outworkers often assembled parcels of clothing in assorted sizes, Rodman was uh, tasked with filling a very specific order for James A. Ventress, a European-educated cotton planter who would soon serve as a founding trustee of the University of Mississippi. But her neighbors did likewise. Harry Stedman's wife produced 29 frocks for the enslaved women owned by the notorious slave trader Isaac Franklin. Sally Gardner stitched 52 frocks and shifts for the women whom William Stamp held in captive in Fort Adams, Mississippi. These Rhode Island girls and women manufactured within a system whose larger workings had once again retreated into the background ostensibly requiring no comment or second thought as they bound producers and consumers across space. Now, did it matter to Mary Rodman's work life that the skill she brought to her sewing, the pride that she took in her work, the social status or stigma that such labor brought to her, the subjectivity that she developed as a worker, that she made frocks and shifts for enslaved women as opposed to some other item, some other commodity, some other connection to New England's industrial transformation? At first glance, the answer is no. The basic contours were the same as for the vast majority of New England girls and women who navigated industrialization over the first decades of the 19th century. Outwork offered rural family the opportunity to deploy female labor more directly towards the acquisition of a higher material standard of living, while the concurrent rise of mechanization and factory wages tempered those opportunities by more explicitly transforming labor into a commodity and subjecting it to intensifying regimes of discipline. Mary Rodman saw this firsthand, moving from sewing to home as a teenager to toiling in a factory with, within just a few years. Whether brooms for urban housekeepers, butter for city grocers, straw bonnets for fashionable ladies, shoes for whalemen, or shifts for slaves, the story was largely the same. 
And yet, I think it would be an error to presume that laboring New Englanders did not confront the distinct moral and political implications of their work on behalf of the slave system. By the 1830s, the public discussion of slavery and its abolition were already loud enough to require people to pick sides, or to make excuses, or to engage in willful obliviousness. At the same time, a racist popular culture provided a predictable store of stereotypes to white residents of the North for denigrating the black men and women who would wear the clothing they stitched, or the hose they forged, or the shoes they pegged. In other words, Mary Rodman did not sew in a vacuum, but rather she did so in the midst of, of particular political and cultural contests over the boundaries of slavery and freedom. And in communities like, of hers, like hers in South Kingston, the legacies of slaveholding, of gradual emancipation, of colonialism, further shaped the contours of earning one's living weaving Negro cloth or pegging slave brogans. If nothing else, it would require the New England makers of plantation goods, as this collective body of, of, of northern manufacturers was called, to undertake additional work, social, spiritual, cultural, to contend that their labor had no further moral political implications, that it bore no reflection of their own ethical standing, or that their handiwork uh, carried no additional signification, that sometimes a shovel was just a shovel. The risk was not merely the opprobrium of sanctimonious reformers. It could also be the ribbing that one would get in the tavern for making a living by making hoes for slaves. At the same time, what were the possibilities for a Rhode Island woman like Dorcas Babcock sewing clothing for Mississippi slaves, perhaps envisioning herself in the guise of her biblical namesake, toiling with devotion to cover the naked and to comfort the suffering. So all in all, these possibilities raise questions of how these economies are connected to one another generally. But more specifically, and to take a term that has been very much in the conversation, complicity, to think about how complicity is lived to create a project in which not asking or searching for the smoking gun to prove that the North had an interest in slavery or that Rhode, England, Rhode Island women made uh, livelihoods for themselves fashioning clothing for slaves. To take this as a given, but then to ask questions about how it was lived, how it was experienced in the 19th century, and to ask what difference this would make to other historical developments. The entrepreneurial culture, for instance, that made New England the Silicon Valley of the 1820s, or the plantation politics that enslaved, in which enslaved people contested the authority of their legal owners and sought to mitigate the worst aspects of their bondage by arguing over such things as these provisions. So by following plantation goods from the communities in which they were made and to those in which they were used, one sees not merely complicity but contingency. That is the unpredictable ways in which choices made in one place have reverberations and shape what choices are possible in another the unintended consequences of the best laid plans, the entanglements of remote lives that are bound together by something so mundane as a frock or a shift. It is here, I suggest, that historians find the most surprises in the past. And so what I've spoken to you about tonight is ultimately out of a book that I'm now finishing that is about these relationships tying remote producers and consumers to one another through these very mundane artifacts like shoes and hats and hose and boots and other textiles that put Yankee ingenuity in the service of the slave plantation. Uh, I study the New England entrepreneurs who mobilized this market. I study laborers like Mary Rodman who produced these goods. Uh, I consider the middlemen and merchants who organized the trade, the slaveholders who constructed their own notions of mastery on the distribution of these goods, and of course the enslaved people who incorporated these goods into their work lives and into their strategies of survival. These stories blur some of the boundaries of the geography of slavery, and recovering these relationships has been vital to rethinking this geography in the 18th and 19th century when uh, what some scholars have called the hinderlands of the slave economies, places far removed from the plantation zones themselves, nonetheless provided crucial material support to a violent system of agricultural commodity production. And you can just think about some of the ways in which these connections work, and they're very familiar to us in a modern sensibility where we're more attuned to being aware of these remote connections between producers and consumers across space. So enslaved men and women on a sugar plantation in Saint-Domingue may have been purchased in West Africa with linens woven in Silesia, copper bars smelted in Wales, or rum distilled in Rhode Island. They may have been sustained on salt beef barreled in Ireland or dressed in textiles from the Lake District in Northwest England. They might have worked at night by the light of spermaceti candles rolled in Nantucket 
And to follow these, the pathways of these goods is to raise questions about the investments of these remote communities of interest in the establishment and perpetuation of Atlantic slavery over several centuries. These increasingly far-flung entanglements across geographical space and across uh, distinct regimes of labor become visible among or across these global commodity chains leading to the production of any particular New England good. Right? The kind of textiles that Mary Rodman was sewing likely contained wool that had come from Argentina or from Smyrna, meaning that the lives of a Mediterranean sheep rancher were somehow connected through these goods to the lives of a Mississippi field hand. We can play this out longer. That wool might have been cleaned by institutionalized paupers at the New York City almshouse before being dyed red using cochineal from Mexico, woven on looms outfitted with reeds from South Carolina, finished at a fulling mill using teasels imported from France. Where will you draw the line, asked one antebellum critic of the slave system. Where does slavery stop? And ultimately, this is where I will leave you tonight with this question. Looking at these goods and thinking about the ways in which these commodity chains tie people far from the plantation to the perpetuation of the slave system, we must ask ourselves about the geographical categories that have so long informed our study, looking at the boundaries between a so-called free north and a slave south, or a free labor economy and a slave labor economy, recognizing that these boundaries hardly sustain the kind of scrutiny that, uh, that scholars can bring to these questions when they look at something so simple as a frock or a hat, a shift, a pair of shoes, or a hoe. Thank you so much. <laughs> Let's just wait till the, um, the screen goes. The screen goes up. Yeah, I want to thank everybody for for coming out, and I particularly would like to thank uh, Walter Johnson, Jennifer Morgan, and Seth Rothman for making uh, this particular conversation possible and to Zach Sell for, uh, for chairing. Also would like to just send uh, thanks to, uh, of appreciation to the Center for Latin American Studies and their Sawyer Seminar Series when they invited the center to participate. And, of, of, and, this, and to thank the center staff, uh, both uh, Maya Gamble Rivers and uh, Shana Weinberg um, for organizing this. In the time uh, allocated to me, I want to make a series of remarks drawn from a sp research project and a book that I'm now doing, tentatively titled Black Critique. The book is a fairly large book and began as a study of uh, freedom. But I realized in writing it that I actually could not do a study of freedom without, not without doing a study of the history of capitalism itself. And so I have had to put aside the sections of the text on freedom um, and turn to a study of the business of capitalism. Since about 1944 and Eric Williams's Capitalism and Slavery, with the thesis that essentially colonial slavery was a foundation for the Industrial Revolution and for industrial capitalism, there has been a serious debate about capitalism and its relationship to slavery. I wanted us talk. I wanted us put that debate in parenthesis, sort of, or put it in some kind of bracket, because I don't want to start with that debate. I actually want to start with a much earlier book, which is 1935, W. B. Du Bois's Black Reconstruction, and I would just want to submit that that is actually where the debate should begin. And I'm not quite sure why historians have begun in 1944 and, uh, and has developed a whole thing on the William thesis, when in fact the real thing about capitalism and slavery, or one of the most remarkable texts about capitalism and slavery, emerges in 1935, Du Bois's Black Reconstruction. Think of the book, the beginning of the book of Black Reconstruction. Think of the title the, of the chapter, The Black Worker which is e essentially changes rem immediately the category of, of the enslaved to that of labor. 
and think of, therefore, what that means theoretically with the transformation of the category of the enslaved to that of worker and how that troubles a whole set of other th ways in which we think about uh, slavery. I would argue that, w that Du Bois's book essentially repositions slavery as central to America's economic development, to capitalism. Think again of the epigraph in chapter one, what <clears throat> where he makes it very clear that the arrival of the black man, he says, and here I'm paraphrasing him, to the United States as that he has been always been <coughs> a central part of the economic of life of America and its democracy. I think that what Du Bois is trying to point that he's trying to make is that capitalism as a mode of production was not separate from racial slavery. That there were not two distinct racial systems, two distinct social systems, but that they were interconnected. And that American slavery and was, could not be seen as could not be called a mode of production or slave production separate from capitalism. Now the mode of production argument again appears in the 1970s with the world systems theory, particularly in places like Brazil and in other parts of Latin America. There are a lot of work around Brazil as a slave mode of production, particularly in the 1980s, looking at large agricultural lands, as well as looking at the mining processes in Brazil. There's also a, 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 very, a vast literature in Latin America in which, which does not talk about slave production, mode of production, but talks about a colonial mode of production in Latin America. So in other words, there has been a preoccupation, not just with the questions of slavery and its relationship to capitalism, but there has been a preoccupation as how do you identify slavery itself? What can you call slavery? How can you call slavery as a labor process and as an economic process, not just as a social, not just as a social system? <clears throat> what is the relationship between colonialism and slavery? What I want to suggest that Du Bois did was to shift the gaze from arguments about mode of production or any descriptive argument about wh what capitalism is, that is primarily a system of wage worker en masse within a factory system, but focuses on labor in a different kind of way. I would want to remind you as well that when Du Bois was doing black reconstruction in 1935, that prior to that, in 1933, they, he was given classes at Atlanta University on capital, um, which means that he was reading Marx and then trying to, trying to think through Marx and his relationship to America. My, mar my remarks, therefore, begins with that Du Bois and perspective of labor and its slave labor and its relationship to capitalism. A great deal of historical work over the past decade or so has been done about what is now called the history of capitalism. The good old Cambridge University and Cambridge University Press has published in 2014 a two-volume history. There has been remarkable scholarship produced by members on this panel, Seth, Walter, and Jennifer. There have been many others who are not in this room who have really tried to think about the relationship between capitalism and history. In this particular pattern or trajectory of scholarship, certain categories have emerged. One category is that what is called war capitalism. Another category that was there long before, in particular in the work of Cedric Robinson from 1983, is what has been called uh, 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 racial capitalism. In Europe, Marcel van Leiden has developed a notion of uh, plantation capitalism as a way to begin to think about a different global history of labor. In all of these works, I would want to suggest there are some general features, that of violence, the question of accumulation, the question of circulation, the ways in which economic institutions uh, operate. And also in many of the works, there has been a focus on the 19th century. And of course, in all of the works, there has been a focus on racialized black bodies. What is also, I think, important in thinking about this body of literature is that there, in the discussions of the histories of capitalism, capitalism, there have been a certain set of prefixes. So that there is primitive accumulation, 
which then leads to merchant capitalism, which then merchant capitalism leads to industrial capitalism, which then leads to financial capitalism, and then which then leads us to late capitalism today and neoliberalism. So that there is a way in which the prefix is then de used as a designator to describe what exactly capitalism is or what kind of, what is the periodization of this particular system. I want to trouble that a bit, that some of these prefixes and periodization, and I can suggest that in thinking about race, slavery, and capitalism, that we are in a new a economic social formation in which questions of, the, that of capitalism, that of commodification, exploitation, alienation, and freedom itself now need to be rethought. One will not have time here for the, for the full argument, but the argument I'm making has enormous political consequences for struggles against various forms of domination, as well as for historical analysis. Let me, for a moment, for example, consider the conventional prefix merchant capital, which is sometimes, which is not sometimes, which is oftentimes subtracted from financial. So it's so merchant and then financial uh, capitalism. Of course, one can begin this particular critique by working, by beginning to look at the work of Rosa Luxemburg on her major theoretical work, The Accumulation of Capital, A Contribution to the Economic Explanation of Imperialism, published in Berlin in 1913, in which she begins to talk about enlarged position. But one of the problems of that particular work, as well as of many other works, is not just a question of what some of us call a commercialization thesis, but really as a way in which capitalism is constructed as an abstract pure form, as a kind of ideal form in which the laws of society and the laws of motion of capital actually operate. My argument there, however, is that there's really no ideal form even in any abstract, in any then kind of abstractions. And that ideal forms in theoretical, in theoretical abstractions are in fact very brittle. And so that what I like to see is say, to, to say is to one, if one is going to theorize a system, then one needs to begin to theorize that system from a set of historical experiences and to do what I call theory from, from history. So let, therefore, let's just get a little bit historically concrete, keeping in mind the business of the categories of merchant and finance. And let me go immediately to, to the Netherlands and to accompany this, this form called the VOC. The VOC is formed in 1602. The capital of the VOC is 6.5 million guilders at that particular point in time. It has 200 shareholders. It has a board of directors. It is a transnational company. I'm talking 1602. It is a transnational company. Its central office is in Amsterdam. It employs 350 persons. Its portfolio, when you look at its books, contains the following things. Slave trade, plantation investments, both in the Caribbean as well as in, as well as in, in, in Indonesia, investment in the spinning wheel in India, investments in South Africa, the, the, the laws and the regulation or the regulations governing the VOC is that it can conduct war, it can conclude treaties, it can take possession of land, and it can build fortresses. Now to me, what you're looking at therefore is not now just a trading company. What you're looking at is about a finance and a trading company. And its sister company, West India, the West, India, West, West Indies uh, Company, is essentially constructed very similarly, but it has a lot more heavy, heavy, heavy side to it with investment houses. And these investment houses are important because these are the investment houses that does two things. One, they do engage in the slave trade. And secondly, they give money to the planters in Suriname, particularly in the, in the Caribbean, to set, to set up their plantations. And, they, and, they, and this is really very funny. I mean, I was reading some of their, some of their books in the last couple of, some of their, their account books. And what was interesting was not, not only do they give the money to the credit to the planters to actually set up the plantations, but they actually buy the source of food for the slaves and the planters, <laughs> and then sell them at a sell it to them at a profit, right? So that they are, they, you know, it is it, it is a total is is really a total system, but it's a system actually based on a certain kind of invest on investment. 
So what you really have are merchant bankers. And that these merchant bankers who run these particular investment houses, therefore, in my view, complicate the idea that somehow this is really merchant capitalism, or mercantile capitalism, and then financial capitalism later on in, in, in the 19th century. But what you really have, in my view, is actually the dominance of finance. And how, do you, how does one see this? There are 2,000 plantations in the small, in the small territory of, uh, of, of Suriname. One of the very first collapse of the stock exchanges in that we have now have in economic history is 1773 in Amsterdam. What's the problem why you have the stock exchange crash? You have this problem because <coughs> the, the, plant, the, the people have given, the investment houses have given the planters in Suriname money for their plantations. The planters are, cannot pay it back. So there is a debt crisis. When, we, I, when one looks at the numbers, it's not really a serious debt crisis, but there's a panic that, this, that somehow this will be larger than what has been there before. And then this led, leads to the, the, a, a crash in, in, in 1773 in the Amsterdam Stock Exchange. So what is, in, what is important, is, I'm saying to you, is that here you are one of the first stock exchanges in the world, but at the foundation of that, which is a financial instrument, at the foundation of that is actually, pl is, is, is actually plantation, is, 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 is um, racial slavery. Or you can take another company, if you want to leave the Dutch and you go to the English, and take the English South, the English uh, South Sea Company of, 17, of 1720, 1720, in which Isaac Newton is an investor. And what is interesting, is that how that company again crashes. But it doesn't crash because people think that the people can't pay back debt, but because there is a rumor that these that people will not be able to pay, to pay back their debt. And as Isaac Newton said, I can, I can understand astronomy, I can understand the stars, but I cannot understand, as he says, the multitude of the madness, the, the, the multitude of the madness. And so what, therefore, what I would want to suggest is that what we have, therefore, is that the colonial enterprise is an enterprise of merchants and of bankers. And that of the slavery enterprise is an enterprise of merchants, bankers, and plantations, and of pla or of planters. To think about this a little bit deeper, one might want to then think about the plantation itself, since we're looking at racial slavery. And a lot of the ideas that we have of the plantation is that it is primarily agricultural. And I would want to suggest to you that that is uh, I, that's not, a, that's not so. That in fact, part, a lot of the, part, uh, the way in which the plantation was structured was really agro-industry. If you think of the Barbadian planta pl plantations, for example, um, and the production of sugar, if you think of the Brazilian plantations, if you think of even of the production of Brazilian mines, mine in Brazil in the 1800s before the abolition of slavery. What you, what, you get a, what you see is not just that people are doing sugar, that is cutting cane, that they're actually making, that they're actually making sugar, and that there's a process of making sugar. So there is an there is a industrial uh, process. And one of the fascinating things about this is that the, some of the, when you look at some of the work of the planters, they begin to call the particular plantations what they call a perfect machine. And the idea, the language of a perfect machine, therefore, is about uh, trying to run a certain kind of industry, trying to run a certain kind of industry. So what I would want to suggest, therefore, is that it is, we might want to shift away from talking about a certain kind of capitalism as war capitalism. Because in fact, colonial capitalism, if you want to call it that, it was about conquest and war. It, you know, it, it is, but this is part of the, the, uh, the way in which colonialism operates is about conquest, is about war, is about taking territory, etc. So that, therefore, that's what it, that's what it un unleashes, and that we might want to think about uh, what I'm tentatively calling something called slave capitalism. That is a, 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 a way in which, going back to prefixes, a way in which we can think through the question of labor, a way we can think through the question of anti-black racism. The way in which we can think about what I'm calling the dump, double, double commodification of labor. In other words, the ways in which uh, the slave is not, the enslaved is not just a person, labor power that produces something, but that is his or her body is also property. 
and therefore that particular process of double commodification. And, theref and to then therefore think, what does that process of double commodification mean when we begin to think about not now those questions of exploitation, but questions of alienations, questions and, and questions, of, uh, questions of domination. So that while we need prefixes and about to try to help us an analytically to come to grips with, with slavery, and, and racial slavery, one of the things I would want to, to, to suggest is that in this business of trying to think through the way, how the system actually works, one of the things that a uh, very good theorist says set, r r r in, a, in an unpublished manuscript makes a point, Sylvia Winter, is that what you're looking about, what you're looking at is the reduction f of man to labor and the reduction of nature to land. And what Ranald called in his 1770s book, um, on the history of the Indies, uh, um, odious, uh, odious commerce. And so therefore, to think about this particular reduction, to think about these processes of, dub of double, double commodification of the enslaved means, in my view, that you are now really have to think through a different conception of freedom. That no longer can you think about human emancipation as only circling around questions of wage labor, but now you have to begin to think about the questions of human emancipation circling around this business of formal human, uh, formal human uh, do domination. And therefore, it would just seem to me that one of the important questions of trying to think about a new history of capitalism is really also to think about a new history of what freedom might mean. Thanks. Um, I want to offer my thanks to the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice, to Tony Bow, to Zach Sal, and to Mara Rivers. Um, Seth said that we were going to, you know, the people were going to intervene in this question in different sorts of scales. And I thought that I was going to be at the largest scale until Tony said, <laughs> I'm writing a project on black critique. Mm -hmm which was going to be a history of freedom, but then I realized I had to tackle the history of capitalism first. So I, th this is going to seem um, Lilliputian in comparison. That was inspiring. Um, I think something that runs through all the papers is the question of where do our categories come from and of trying to develop and to think through, to recognize in the first instance uh, the extent to which the categories that we have used to understand the history of slavery and capitalism as two different things are in fact products of that history. So to recognize the extent to which they're structured in dominance and to try to, um, to, to, to clean up, to decolonize our methodology um, and in, in different <laughs> ways. And, and I think that is a project that, that um, as Tony in particular said is a project of long standing in, um, in what I would call the black radical tradition. And I'm going to start with um, my way into that, which is, is through the work of Cedric Robinson. And then, then I'm also going to talk a bit about Du Bois. Um, black Marxism, for those of you who have not read it, is a extremely complicated um, very dense and absolutely indispensable book. And um, one of the things that Robinson does in that book is that he establishes um, separate pathways. He establishes a pathway of history to describe the long history of bonded labor in Europe and its empire and the long history of xenophobia in Europe and its empire. And he's very, very concerned to try to treat those pathways as different to begin with. And what Robinson tries to illustrate through the course of black Marxism or through the course of the, you know, the first 250 pages, say, um, is, is that these are separate strands of history that become interwoven in the 15th century, but they're never identical to one another. And that's what I, you know, so when Tony talks about Du Bois chapter, The Black Worker, um, what strikes me about that, that title is that there's a tension there. Right, that the, the Du Bois is creating, and you know, I used to read, and I used to think, oh my God, Du Bois is, so, you know, he's become too Marxist, and he's 
He's overlaying the history of slavery with these Marxian categories about class, and he's making everybody seem like a worker, right? But that's not what he's doing. And it, it's only recently that I've understood the title of that chapter, The Black Worker, as being a chapter which has a dynamic tension in it. It's things which cannot be reduced to one another, right? So you can't simply argue that slavery was a class relationship because there's a, there's a, there's a libidinal character to white supremacy, to racial dominance, right? There's an excessive aspect to white supremacy and racial dominance that can't simply be understood through economic categories, right? So the example, I mean, this is, this is a different period, but the thing that I'm obsessed with currently is the history of St. Louis. And so in, in 1949, they opened the largest open air swimming pool in the world in the city of St. Louis. And on the opening day, three black kids jump in there. There's a riot in St. Louis. They close the pool and they don't reopen it for the whole summer. That's on oh, my microphone. <laughs> That's excessive, right? <laughs> There's something about that that goes beyond some kind of notion of, of racism and white supremacy as a proxy for class relationships. But there are also, and this, is, this has been harder for me to understand, but there are also aspects of the history of racial capitalism that are so general, so hegemonic that they are no longer in their dominant usage, strictly racial. And it seems to me that this is, in a way, what, what Jennifer is talking about. It's the way that a set of technologies that emerge out of the history of white supremacy and slavery become the technologies through which human, being, human beings, as such, are measured, mm -hmm. right? The notion of population. And that's what I actually take away from Sylvia Winter's notion of man. Right of, of the sort of universalization of a particular sort of person who is a, a historical product, the product of empire slavery and white supremacy, but then becomes the way that people generally understand themselves. Now, so as, as a population, or as people who, who think about their lives probabilistically or economically. And, and Winter, I think, and, and Winter is, again, extremely difficult, somebody who I've only just started to read, but who hails us to try to find a different, deeper sort of notion of, a different, deeper, and I think more loving notion of, of humanity. So, so if you take these, these ideas of these separate strands, these separate strands of commerce and xenophobia, the idea that's in Robinson is that these things are combined in slavery and settler colonialism, and that that marks a new moment in the history of the world. The place that I would start with that in Du Bois is, is uh, in 1926 in the essay on the souls of white folk in Darkwater. And what Du Bois argues in that essay is he argues that neither xenophobia nor bondage were new things in the 15th century. Ever have men striven to conceive of their victims as different from the victors, endlessly different in soul and blood, strength and cunning, race and lineage. Likewise, the using of man for the benefit of masters is in no way a new invention of modern Europe. It is quite as old as the world. So what he's saying there is that racial domination and economic exploitation each have very, very long histories. And then, but Europe proposed to apply it on a scale and with an elaborateness of detail which no former world ever dreamed. The imperial width of the thing, its heaven-defying audacity makes its modern newness. So what Du Bois is saying there is that there's something new in world history about the slave trade. There's a new period in world history, and I would argue that that is the period of racial capitalism. Now, what I want to say about that is, um, and it's going to be very, very general, but it's not static or proleptic. And I, I, I think by, by proleptic, I mean I, I want to try to speak to something that I think Jennifer 
talked about at the beginning, which is that it would be a mistake to take the idea of racial capitalism and imagine that what that means is that contemporary ideas of race have always existed. What the idea of racial capitalism seems to me to be about is about the dynamic co-creation and, and evolution, the dialectic of the notions of racial difference and capitalist practices, right? So it's a dynamic and contingent relationship that changes over time. Now, so, so what do I think, um, why do I think that this is a useful important, crucial, essential idea. Um, it seems to me that first of all, the, the idea of racial capitalism treats the history of slavery, empire, and industrial development as simultaneous and integrated aspects of one another. It doesn't necessarily reduce them to one another, and so one of the critiques is gonna be, well, if you say what happens in Manchester is capitalism, and you say what happens in Mississippi is capitalism, and you say what happens in Mali is capitalism, then how are we gonna sort out the difference between Manchester, Mississippi, and Mali? That seems to me to actually be a, a, an infantile and fatuous and intentionally obstructionary reading. I mean, really? You know, honestly, like we're not going to be able to tell the difference between Manchester and Mississippi if somebody calls them both capitalists? It's ridiculous. Okay. <laughs> what I think this notion does is that it moves beyond, and this is really to resonate with something that Tony said, the notion of capitalism as a prehistory, uh, I'm sorry, slavery as the prehistory of capitalism, as pre-capitalist. The term pre-capitalist, which has this enormous purchase in social science methodology, is actually, an, it's an intellectually and historically incoherent term, right? It's, it's teleological in, in, a, in, an, um, in an intellectually unsupportable way. And what it does then is it helps us think through, I think, the limitations of Marx, the limitations of Smith, the limitations of Brodel, all of whom treat slavery as a unfully, thus, as, as Jennifer says, pushed to the margins, prehistory of the main event, capitalism. The other thing, and I want to insist on this, and, and I think, um, I think it's important is, and, and I think that this actually, um, there's, a, there's a conversation to be had here, Tony, about why one might want to, to insist on the notion of racial capitalism, is it insists on the imperial aspect of racial capitalism, and in so doing, it draws attention in the history of the United States, but also in the history of the Western Hemisphere in general, to Indian removal and to genocide as integral aspects of the same process, right? So we all, in one way or another, are working out of an African-American intellectual tradition. But one of the things that I find um, powerful in, in Du Bois, where there, there's an acknowledgement, although not a, I think, um, substantial engagement with this question, is the idea of these things as imperial and that imperial history thus then forcing us to think about, inviting us to think about, requiring that we think about um, Native American dispossession as an aspect of this. Um, that is removal and genocide as well as labor exploitation and um, social reproduction generally are always already processes of sexual and reproductive domination, right? And this is, I think, again, to gesture really at Jennifer's first book. Um, and so one of the, the things that, that I think the notion of racial capitalism then calls upon us to do is to think about the relationship of um, sexuality, reproduction, racial futurity to empire and slavery. And, and how then, when, when I try to talk about, when I, when I was talking earlier about um, thinking about racial capitalism as dynamic, one would wanna think about the way that um, Andrew Jackson is um, genocidal in relationship to Native Americans He's absolutely uninterested in Native American reproduction, so his genocidal policy is a mis particularly misogynistic form of racial violence, right? 
Andrew Jackson, as a slaveholder, is interested in African American reproduction. Right? That's not to say that, that it's easier to be enslaved than it is to be Cherokee. It is, however, to say that when we think about racial capitalism in its different way, we need to think about its reproductive and sexual aspect. Um, because that reproduction, reproductive and sexual aspect is part of how these things are actually constitutive, dynamically constitutive of racial identity rather than reflecting some sort of prior you know, formation, racial formation. Um, so why finally do I think this is important? I think it's just, I mean, I think it's important because it's empirically true. And, um, and I, th I think that, that, that this is something that, that Tony illustrated with the story of the Amsterdam Stock Exchange or the VOC, that capitalists, you, you know, the, the, the basic at, at root, when you talk about the history of capital in the Atlantic world, the capital that you are talking about is in many instances human beings. So it doesn't actually make, and, and, and so, so, so the way that I think about this is, is how does the cotton trade work? Well, the cotton trade, which is the, the, the exemplar, the unquestioned exemplar of capitalist, industrial capitalist modernity, works on an advance basis where every year cotton merchants in Great Britain make advances to American merchant bankers who make advances to planters. Well, one thing about cotton merchants and merchant bankers is that they're greedy and they're not stupid, which is to say they do not make unsecured advances, right? Those advances are made against security. That security comes in two forms, enslaved human beings or expropriated Indian land, right? So that is to say the capital that is at the bottom of the Atlantic commercial economy that leads to, that, that supports the industrial capitalism of Liverpool, that capital is either stolen land or stolen people. So it doesn't then make sense to try to, to and this, this is again to come back to a way that Tony talked about, it doesn't make sense to try to set up some kind of archetype a, a social science definition of capital and say, well, this is, this is what we see and capital has, capitalism has these seven forms and it doesn't, we don't see that in Mississippi. The actually existing capitalism of the 19th century in that, a lot of that capital was human or stolen land. Pragmatically um, speaking, it's just a pleasure to be at a place called the St Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice. Right? Because it's that normative ethical turn that I think our, um, our world um, too frequently, too infrequently allows. And basically, the, the, the reason that I think it's important to try to think about the history of slavery, the history of the Atlantic world, the history of the United States, and really the history of the world as a history of racial capitalism is because it forwards to us then a specific kind of historical subject. If one imagines that the history of capitalism is the history of Manchester, one then concludes that the universal subject of history is a white wage worker from Manchester. If one insists upon capitalism as always already racial, one imagines a different sort of historical subject as the central subject of our, our studies, our history, and the lessons that we can draw from history. And so that's why I would want to, to try to insist upon this. Thank you very much. Conversation between the panel first, um, and then and then move out to questions. <laughs> Can I'll, I'll jump in. I, one of the things that I've um, uh, been working through recently is how early um, enslaved people stand in for currency. Um, the earliest uh, uh, bill, oh, there goes a chair. 
Um, the earliest example that I've seen is in 1504 or 5, in which a, 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 a Spaniard um, describes a ship returning um, from Hispaniola loaded with gold, when in fact it's loaded with slaves. But he uses the word, and they're, they're Africans who've been rerouted back into, um, into Iberia, but he uses the words interchangeably. And, and they're very early instances um, uh, of, of Africans being um, kind of elided with gold or with other forms of currency as, and, and being used to pay debts. And I think that that, as you were talking about um, the capital at the bottom of the Atlantic commercial economy, um, what is really crucial to me is to think through what is the same and what is different about those 15th century moments um, in which I think uh, hit, scholars are really interested in sort of um, the way that categories of wealth and uh, and commerce are still kind of, in, you know, they're embedded in religion, they're embedded in, in much earlier forms of thinking, but that that the 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 leg, the the forward motion um, uh, seems to me to be, um, in that connection, in that elision um, that starts out as just some people who are enslavable and turns into this entire category of people who are enslavable, but nonetheless uh, is, is wedded to the emergence of, of this long distance um, uh, trade and uh, exchange of, of goods and monies. I did want to yeah. sorry, sorry. Mm -hmm. No, no, go ahead. Okay. I did have a question that I think runs across uh, several of the papers, which starts in a way with Jennifer's point about race thinking mm -hmm. as standing in for sometimes like the deeper historical scholarship mm -hmm. that is necessary mm -hmm. to differentiate between different periods. <coughs> a question about racial capitalism in its kind of like broadest, expansive, and explanatory sense to move away from an account of capitalism abstracted from that, or an idea of slave capitalism that can kind of articulate the specificities of, of a, a form emerging from slavery. Because I think those are three different approaches to, to shared set, set of problems. But I think as much, another way that when you posed uh, your question, Jennifer, I, I kind of flipped it in one sense where I was thinking too, sometimes actually there's a way in which thinking about slavery uh, removes deeper consideration of racialization mm -hmm. and, and its significance as well. I think that there's a way in which we could think differently about Marx's work is not having a problem in considering slavery as part of capitalism, even though there's huge limitations to that, but actually to understand the deep significance of race and racism mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can I just say two things? Um, one in response to Jennifer's really very good question. As you were speaking, Jennifer, one of the things I was thinking about was not s was that I don't know if uh, an earlier period, but mm -hmm. what I was thinking of immediately was the the mine silver mining in Peru mm -hmm. and the forms of indentured uh, serv servitude mm -hmm. of the, the indigenous population mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the large mines that the that the the Spanish had. Um, and then really saying to that what we what we have perhaps in the 15th century is uh, running concurrently are forms of indenture and unfree labor and mm -hmm. slave labor, mm -hmm. and that the, all of these things run uh, run simultaneously, mm -hmm. um, and that what then is important for me is is to, to think therefore that capitalism is now not one regime of labor, mm -hmm. but that the unfree labor, indentured labor, and so are all part, different regimes of labor are actually part of the actual system, mm -hmm. reinforce each other, are connected to mm -hmm. each other, and, um, and therefore opens up a different political mm -hmm. space to mm -hmm. begin to think about what struggles may actually, mm -hmm. um, may, struggles may actually look like. I think that's right. Um, so, that, so, that's the, so that's what your question made mm -hmm. me begin to think, I mean, I, you know, I mean, I, I can't think of a, an earlier period. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know the specific answer to mm -hmm. say it may be 14, 15, sort mm -hmm. of, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but I just think that you're looking at, you're looking at the, a, a certain kind of transformation um, in both in the discussion of people, 
but also in the discussion of labor mm -hmm. and, 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 and forms of labor that, 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 are now, uh, that are occurring at a specific, specific historical moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in response to Zach's question, I mean, let me say that I, I, I go between racial capitalism, um, Walter, and slave capitalism. So <laughs> some days I say racial capitalism, some days I say slave capitalism. Um, and, and part of the reason to talking about slave capitalism is not to elide race, but it's, but it's really is to think through this labor question in, 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 in a much more, in a complicated way as, wo as, as one can. Um, and, to, and, and to try and think through this question of, of, of forms of domination. All right, um, that 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 emerge in that emerge in in slave in, in, in what in what I'm calling oh, in quotation marks slave capitalism, because what I would want to argue is that the actually construction of slavery and the tr transformation of the double commodification process that occurs at that moment through racial difference and so on and so forth and racial white supremacy and all of those things then also means that there is a way in which you, that gender operates, right? That, 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 that in, in the way in which um, other forms of, uh, I would like to call, other forms of relations of domination are then opened up. And so that's what, that's, that is what, that's what, that's what I'm thinking of. So, so there's a debate, for example, in, uh, in 1774 in Jamaica and in Antigua um, between planters about women. Because they, they, because women are, um, when you look at the numbers, uh, there are more women in the field than men, mm -hmm. right? And so they're trying to work through. You know, some people are saying, you know, what is it that you're doing? You should be treating people like that. Um, and some people are saying, no, no, they work better than men. I mean, there's a whole set. Of, sorry, there's a whole set of uh, arguments. And it is only at a certain point when I think that the that the, 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 the business of, uh, um, of the reproduction of gender mm -hmm. and, the, and the necessity for, they, be, they begin to say, okay, we need to think about how to reproduce slaves more. That they begin to think about, okay, let's treat, as one plant says, Madison, <laughs> let's, they, we are perhaps treating these women too, what he says, we are giving them too much hard labor. Mm -hmm. We need to, re we need to think, rethink mm -hmm. those questions. Mm -hmm. And so that, again, to me, this, it's, 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 this quest, it's this business of what do you do with the enslaved and mm -hmm. how do you treat the enslaved, mm -hmm. how do you treat those that you have constructed as, not, as, less, than, mm -hmm. as less than human and, and, and the arguments and the arguments mm -hmm. around that. I, would just, if, I don't want to... No, no. Um, but I think that that's a really good example of this thing that I sort of glossed over mm -hmm. about the, that we are inheriting these categories mm -hmm. that come to us from 18th century abolitionists, mm -hmm. because that is a, that's a, that's precisely a moment in which, uh, in which gender is functioning in a particular way to 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 sort of say, oh, there are women in the fields, mm -hmm. when in fact what we what we know mm -hmm. sort of, but mm -hmm. it's hard because of the evidence is that. Women are, you know, between forty and fifty percent of captives in the first hundred and fifty years of the mm -hmm. slave trade. But we have, but the, but the evidence for that is hard to come by, right? The slave trade database mm -hmm. only gives us these glimpses of it. A lot of it is in mm -hmm. Spanish and Portuguese, mm -hmm. and so the, the data isn't as, as, isn't as, as. And so what, what I think I know mm -hmm. then is that, for, uh, you know, for two hundred years. Women have been in the field, yes. right? Yes. And slave owners have been, it's not even mm -hmm. a subject of conversation. It, it, but then mm -hmm. it becomes a subject yeah. of conversation for many reasons mm -hmm. at the end of the 18th yeah. century. And, and then that woman yes. stands in in the same way that Walter talked mm -hmm. about Sylvia Winters, kind of th that, that universal woman who's mm -hmm. not African, who's not a s enslaved, mm -hmm. but who then gets applied to <laughs> this woman of African descent in the field, it, it, it's confusing, right? Yeah. So then it, it means that we need a new way to talk about yeah. how gender is operating mm -hmm. in the first hundred years of enslavement. I um, I but I think that it's a, it's a really good yeah, point. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. No, thanks. Yeah. It's, it's hugely schematic, but as far as trying to imagine the history of the changing categories, mm -hmm. um, I think it's, it's probably fair to say that by and large, the categories of the Atlantic slave trade are categories of, of nationality. 
right. Yes. Monte, Ebo, yes. And that the, the categories of the era of slavery that happens after the Atlantic slave trade are increasingly racial mm -hmm. categories, the Negro, grief, mulatto, mm -hmm. and that then has a sexual aspect, a sexual regulatory racial <coughs> aspect. And so I, I think that, that as one of the things I'd want to do then with the, the notion of racial capitalism is to try to, to actually sort of track that argument out so one that could, could make it in writing rather than do it just saying it, mm -hmm. right, and to say that the invention, so, so, so Robinson dates the invention of the Negro to the moment of the slave trade. Mm -hmm. And the invention of the Negro is the notion of someone who is evacuated from history and, and, and is thus infinitely comparable to other Negroes. Mm -hmm. I don't actually think that's empirically what happens yeah. with the slave yeah. trade because I think there is all of this sort of reckoning through national stereotypes and that the invention of the Negro in Robinson's sense is the invention of a more familiarly racialist discourse of anti-blackness, mm -hmm. say, that is focused on on um, direct sort of biological lineage and, and, a, and mm -hmm. a certain kind of notion of mm -hmm. sexual regulation. Mm -hmm. and th that does seem to me, at least in the, this, this sort of the smaller um, knowledge that I have about the United States, that does happen with the closing of the slave trade mm -hmm. and then the beginning of a set of com commercial comparisons mm -hmm. around these these different kinds of imagined aspects of, of racial difference. Mm -hmm. I, I had a question for, for Seth, if I could. Um, because I was thinking about the, the, the way you ended, right, like the, the, the loom with parts from South Carolina and France and the wool that's going. And I, I guess, I, like, how, how far back mm -hmm. do you want to do do you you know using because I think that what both Walter and Tony have have, have you know have framed this pr have have asked us to frame this history of capitalism uh, I don't know in again so you remember I said I wasn't a scholar of capitalism <laughs> <laughs> other stuff. Neither, so, neither, how, neither <laughs> yeah, so how would you how would you frame the the because the the moment that you're talking about feels very connected to what I understand as industrial right mm. it, it's about the production of goods and then connecting that through understanding that as being deeply embedded in the history of slavery um, how how much earlier do you want to oh, think I, about the history of things that are moving around and that are produced by slave labor well, I mean, I think one would study the, the flows of commodities into West African slaving ports mm -hmm. uh, in the 16th century mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, basically tracing them back to Gujarat or mm -hmm. to Wales or to Amsterdam or wherever it might be. Uh, and I think um, that process of early modern global integration mm -hmm. runs through the slave trade, mm -hmm. runs through the development of, uh, of, of, of new incentives to produce goods that will... Mm -hmm. find buyers in West Africa, fundamentally. And, uh, you know, and in, I, I see an increasingly uh, growing uh, population. I mean, this, this helps us rethink, for instance, the industrious revolution, right? What are the, why are uh, European households in the 17th century uh, engaging in what one economic historian calls the mode of self-exploitation, working themselves harder, devoting more of their familial labor to producing things for the market? What are the incentives? Well, the incentives are, of course, things that enslaved people have grown in the Americas, like sugar. Uh, and the incentives are to produce things that can be then vended in West Africa. And so I, I think some of the largest sort of transformations that precede the Industrial Revolution uh, as part of early modern global history uh, very much run through the slave trade. And I would put that at the center. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's true. I mean, I would say I absolutely agree. With and, and and point to and point to France and point to the to Nantes, the mm -hmm. city of Nantes, um, and the, the the Loire Valley, and the way and the, the river that the boats those boats came up in the 1600s before they went to um, Africa mm -hmm. and then to Saint Domingue, and that a stone's throw, a literal stone's throw, from where those boats land. Um, came in was a factory of nearly 4,000 workers making textiles. Mm 
that would then that were taken from India, and that would we were redone mm -hmm. because of the certain of the market in West Africa, um, and so that you you thinking about you have to think about those those workers just a stone right. throw, right. right, away from the ships, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so that the things can be carried to the ships and how it comes from India right. th to them first. They remake it in a certain style, which you wish Africans are. Right. I mean, from the, res from the perspective of, of, of global economic history, right, I mean, then all of a sudden uh, we need Asia in the story. We need China as the, as the sun around which the early modern global economy orbits. So, I mean, how is it that most New World silver ends up in Chinese coffers, mm -hmm. right? That has to be part of, of, slavery has to be part of that story, and that story has to be part of the story of slavery. Um, so, I mean, I think it gets very big very quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Should we um, open up the floor for the conversation? Please. People have questions. I think we have a, about a half an hour uh, for continued conversation. Malika? Thank you for this conversation. I have a question for Jennifer. I'm really interested about what you're seeing about like 15, 1504 is the first moment in which you see people left, sort of like mm -hmm. or whatever. So I see that as like, see as a moment where you have you know, a category of people are othering, so to say, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering to what extent you see, or if you're tracing the ways in which this knowledge about folks and subjects um, goes and transfers to the English colonies 100 years later. Do you trace that? How do you see that happening? It's like from what you know, it's happening in 1504 versus what's happening in, in 17th century Virginia and the laws. I, I mean, yeah. to, to me, I've, I've always relied a lot on the circulation of travel accounts and the the way that stories are, um, you know, are both published and are told by uh, and translated into English and um, and and then circulate in England. You know, the I've been reading a lot of. Um, 1620 pamphlet literature about <laughs> it's it's yeah, so yeah. thrilling um, uh, about about currency and about what happens when English coin leaves the land and whether you know and 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 the 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 people the men who are associated with this kind of early theorizing about the economy are deeply concerned about what the spanish have done the past 100 years and so there's an enormous like there's a lot of attention uh pay, that's being paid to um to the spanish in the americas as well as on the african coast yeah you know, the bonded African from their human, humanness, you know, in the sort of legal laws that came by, do you find that in the discussion of how to justify denying, you know, um, African descended free people mm -hmm. from, you know, testifying mm -hmm. court or what have you, is that connected to this That's discussion about you money? Know I, I actually, I don't know. I've mm -hmm. written about uh -huh. both things, yeah. but um, my focus on like the history of the law in colonial Virginia is really through like a more formal uh, legal history rather than this kind of swirling space of overlap. So I'm just I'm going to say I'm going to think about that. Okay. Thank you. It's a really good question. Good question. Thank you. Uh, a comment to Jennifer. And thank you for the presentation. When you mentioned. Uh, the interchangeable between Gaul and slave. Mm -hmm. It's worth mentioning that the Taino were exterminated in the trade industry from Europe to the Hispaniola. Mm -hmm. And the reason why that happened was because they fought to the T for what they, belong, what they thought belonged to Dan and nothing but. There were 25,000 river in the Hispaniola that were destroyed completely tried to explore the gold. Mm -hmm. So when they were going to the Hispaniola, they were taking golds, and they, in, in exchange, they were bringing nonsense. Mm -hmm. And then when they realized that the island of, was so agricultural productive because they already had the tobacco and the yuca, they decided to bring and export uh, the, the slave or the, or the uh, Negro, who in the Hispaniola was not a, a despicable term mm -hmm. at the beginning. It was sort of a way because the Taino were Negro, mm -hmm. black color, dark color, mm -hmm. and they wanted to embrace that. So when the 
the African came um, for in slave in turn of slavery. They didn't know it was slavery. They, it was sort of bringing people to cultivate the land, and then they realized that there were people, the owner coming in to take over. So that's how it happens that they were bringing gold, and the reason why the Hispaniola got attack sort of by different corner. If you look at the southwest, there were England who created the mulatto in exchange. And then you look at the west, south, with the north is the white, per se, from Spain. So there was an inter interchange of trade where, if you look at the history, the Hispaniola was the land of trade to the America since Colum Christopher Columbus. I thank you for that. I would, I would just say that by the time um, Columbus, by the time the first enslaved Africans are transported to Hispaniola, um, enslaved people have been sold in Portugal and Spain yeah. for over 50 yeah. years. So there was, a, there was a depth of understanding about, uh, there was a depth of, 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 of um, grappling with who was enslavable and where they could be enslaved from and where they could be sold to that had already, you know, been going on for half a century at that point. So I think there's, there's, um, that's part of what I'm interested in is sort of unpacking that. So thank you. I'm sure. Hi, I have a oh, question for Walter. I was thinking about, well, actually it's kind of a question for Dr. Bones as well, thinking about the way of putting uh, these long questions together. So you referenced three or four or five different forms of capitalist reproduction, uh, but how do we ask questions, particularly long questions such as uh, issues pertaining to settler colonization, how do we ask long array questions or tell long array stories when we have different temporal periods mm -hmm. where different things are occurring. Those two things seem very difficult to reconcile. Could you all give a little bit of advice on that? Because I'm working through that right now. <laughs> it's a terrific question. And I, I think that um, I, I think the point is is to recognize and to embrace exactly what you said, which is that, there, that, that it's a complex rather than a simple relationship. And, so, and, and it's also complex because the different sorts of struggles that emerge out of these historical experiences are different, right? I mean, the, 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 the um, opposition to settler colonialism is a focus on sovereignty, right? And so that's a different kind of political mobilization than the opposition to slavery. And so there's an enormous complexity to it. Just as there are also, you know, there's a, there's a tremendous and complicated overlap, right? Most obvious in the case of um, the dispossession of the southeastern tribes and the emergence of uh, the Cotton Kingdom, right? But more complicated, so for instance, in relationship to the history of St. Louis that I'm interested in. St. Louis, among other things, was the... Um, administrative and um, technical, practical center of the Indian Wars, right? St. Louis is also the place from which we get the, the, the first black soldiers in the, in, the, in the United States Army in 1861, who then become the bedrock of the 9th and 10th Cavalry, right? The Buffalo Soldiers. And so there's a, then, the, the, through, the, through the Buffalo Soldiers, and I think this is something that Du Bois embraces and thinks about, there's a there's a a offering of a certain kind of martial freedom to African American men after the Civil War that is embedded in U.S. imperialism, right? So enormously complicated and and not always synchronous stories. I mean, you're you're you know in a way your question is I think the the that's like a footnote to your question, just simply to say the question is actually the answer. You gotta just embrace it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I agree with you also. I, mean, I think that there's, I think the long durée is to, to, to think about uh, questions of colonialism and slavery. One of the difficulties we have in US history 
is that, in my view, is that we don't think about colonialism. As a, we tend to, you know, we, 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 we tend to think about slavery and so on and, um, and the revolution and you know. But the actual thing that this actually was part of British America um, for many years, right, is I think really very important. Um, and that you can't think about that colonial project in the Americas without not thinking about forms of slavery or unfree labor. Um, you, you, you just can't. Um, so if you think about, if, you, if you're if you moving from the United States to say Latin America, you have to you have to think about both questions of slavery and indentured for the, for the indigenous population. In, um, in the same way you have to think about that question. In the Caribbean you have to think about the, again, forms of genocide. Um, but just want the colonialism uh, and and then and 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 and, 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 the, and slave and slave labor and plantation labor. So to me, it's in thinking about the long jury is in thinking about colonialism and slavery and that and that relationship um, and how that relationship actually shapes each other, but also quite frankly uh, shape 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 uh, shape shapes capitalism. And what what I think and what I think. Um, I mean, what I think people like Brodel and so on, you know, miss is that, in other words, they, it is not just that he misses slavery, it is that he misses the actual centrality of the colonial project um, to to European to European history, um, and and uh, and Marx himself, I think, misses it as well. So you know, and you know, he gives you know, he writes some things on colonialism and so on, but the the actual centrality of colonialism too. To, 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 to the world and to the shaping of the making of the, the modern world is something that is not really thought through, I think, in, 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 in serious ways. And that's why, I mean, that's why, that's why I see that. I think, you know, I think it's a great question and I, I will approach it the way I want to suggest. Can, can I ask, ask a question and try to answer a question that may be in back of the question, which is that I do think that um, for projects such as the one you kind of just gave a thumbnail of, there's a couple of very powerful emergent bodies of thought that you're going to have to navigate around, and I think it's extremely important to navigate the, around them. One is an idea that um, racial derogation in the United States of America is fundamentally and really solely anti-blackness, and that Native Americans have always been honorary whites. And the other is that African Americans are, in fact, settler imperialist adjuncts. I, for, for, for my, the, the reason that I would then, in relationship to those two bodies of thought, think, you know, insist upon racial capitalism is because I think that one wants to work through all of the complexity and the ways that people have unquestionably been pitted against one another, right? To, to try to, to, to really develop a critique of white supremacy out of that complexity, rather than what seemed to me to be kind of emergent, um, invidious politics um, you know, in, in different sectors of, of thought. Um, thank you. I really like the work that um, you've all been doing problematizing um, categories. And I, um, I might riff uh, for a moment off um, something Jennifer said. I think um, the concepts of uh, freedom and democracy also make people lazy. You know, if you have those, you don't have to think anymore. And um, I wonder whether uh, some or all of you might like to speak to how the tools and perspectives um, we gain from problematizing and entangling slavery and capitalism also give us ways to think about uh, social and economic justice today. I mean, for example, um, you know, a giant um, multinational company that pays no tax might feel that, well, they're providing jobs, and without them, millions of people would kind of fade away. But on the other hand, um, what does it mean to actually recognize a person as a person? Because I mean, the, one of the differences between slavery and freedom is this recognition of, of personhood, 
but if if your if your wage structure is such that a person effectively has just enough calories to work and then they they can't do anything else, isn't that like treating a person like a toaster? You, know, you put them in the cupboard with the light off and no electricity when they're not working. Um, but um, I, I I wonder whether there are other concepts that then become problematized almost like like dominoes from slavery capitalism to freedom of democracy. I get my, my secret um, title for a whole bunch of my intellectual work is against freedom. Mm -hmm. right? And so I think that in a way what what Jennifer's talking about and what Tony's talking about is the historical foreshortening of yeah. actual human, human emancipation into something that is basically a liberal notion of freedom. And so I think it's, it's an absolutely integral part of the project. And I think that, you know, in, in the United States, I mean, you can, you can see it happen. And the, the, the history of Reconstruction is a history of the foreshortening of um, a, a radical possibility of human emancipation mm -hmm. into what comes to be known as freedom, mm -hmm. it seems to me. Yeah. And I think that, I, I mean, I think that there's all of the categories that we are working, I mean, the challenge is is that sometimes in your effort to come up with a way of historicizing the category, you get, you drown in language. You know, I mean, and I think that that's why, for example, reading Cedric Robinson is so challenging, or reading Sylvia Winter is because I, I'm, they didn't drown in language, but they are exemplifying how difficult it is to 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 unpack the the damage that's done to our conceptual capacities by the afterlife of slavery, right? That we that our categories are foreshortened that we. We, we, we imagine that, that there are these antitheses of slavery and freedom, for example, to name just one, and that, and that there are, or that there are places that are culture versus economy versus, um, you know, just like, I, I don't know, like it just, it, it's very hard to write that clearly um, and smartly, <laughs> I find. <laughs> As uh, Professor Johnson, you just said, if racism and economic uh, exploitation are mutually constituting, that's obviously not a base superstructure model. So how, how do you work in this sort of intersection between cultural um, and political economy, I guess? Are you I'm trying to get me to say that I'm a cultural Marxist? <laughs> <laughs> I, would never, I would never do such a thing. <laughs> Sort of practical, like nuts and bolts, right? How do you work in the sort of intersection of these two different approaches as you all do to, to, to make it work? And that, that's why I want to insist on racial capitalism, yeah. right? I mean, and, and so if, if you look at, for instance, this fantastic kind of debate between um, Tony Hasey Coates and Cedric Johnson, right, where Cedric Johnson writes this fantastically um, sharp critique of Coates. And he says, well, well, Coates is, everything for Coates is about race. And that's true, Coates is a nationalist. He's an intellectual nationalist. And so he wants to see everything as white supremacy, right? It's superstructure in the terms that you got Robinson comes back, he says, no, no, everything's about class. Everything's about base, right? And and in fact, what we have is a set of ideologies that are masking material exploitation that is fundamentally class exploitation. I think that, that, that here you have two brilliant people who were talking past one another, and the, the missing term is Du Bois. The missing term is racial capitalism. I think Du Bois does it brilliantly. And so I, I try not to get too, and maybe this is just because I haven't quite got there intellectually to be able to really directly answer your question. I try not to get too into priors. I mean, I, I, I just don't see, you know, ideas have a material history, right? 
every encounter with the material is always already a cultural encounter with the material. So I, you know, I, I try not to. I try to use metaphors that are of uh, that are about simultaneity and you know hybridity or you know saturation. And, and it, it, it's possible that that's just me not having figured out an answer to your question. But I think that. I just think that those the, those kind of priors that we've been given are not super helpful. They're not realistic, right? I mean, we, what, when do we ever in our own lives actually separate, you know, ideation from material practice? I just, I just don't see it happen. So for me then, I guess I'm coming around to an answer, and the answer as to so many other things is along with the boys, Raymond Williams, right? Marxism and literature is for me then a, a real, a, a kind of a touchstone in that. Yeah, I think that, Part of the difficulty is, has been a certain kind of reading of Marx in my view, particularly from the German ideology, that which then sets up base superstructure, base superstructure argument. Um, and part of that is, you know, class race. So what is race is ideology, class is foundational. Um, and because it is rooted in economic and productive things. The way, the way I like to think about it is, is that we, quite frankly, moving from Williams through Stewart, through Sylvia Wynn, is that we might want to think about, rather than thinking about modes of production, which then gets you back into trying to think whether the base is there, the superstructure is there, what's the relationship, is it dialectical, which is but come first, the chicken or the egg, and so on and so forth. You we might want to think about something called production of of the human, and go back to something that actually Marx says in Capital, which is that economic relations are relations between people. It's something that we lose, and if that economic relationships are essential relations between people, then what is important is. Uh, the set of relationships between human beings that are formed in material provisioning, in living, and so on and so forth. And therefore, what might be important is a, is a certain production of what we are and who we are at specific moments. Right? I mean, that's, 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 that's how I try to sidestep that particular question, which means that one is not working as a kind of cultural fairies or a political economist over here. Right, and so on. But actually, one is trying to think through that, that a certain simultaneity. In other words, that as we produce certain material things, provision, you know, engage in material things for you know, provisioning and so on and so forth, that simultaneously we are actually producing narratives about ourselves as we do this. We're not. It's a, you know, it's not one come first, and it is almost it's, 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 it's a certain simultaneous simultaneity, right? And then trying to think, okay, how then do you as a scholar work within that and become the, so the word, the operational word for methodology is complexity, <laughs> right? And not trying to find one master key. It's a aha. Now I have it, and I can then open the door to 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 knowledge. I don't think so. I think it's it's really trying to understand. Those simultaneous things to understand that society as an assemblage rather than a kind of structure, hard set of social structure. And, if it's, and therefore, if you understand it that way, then you understand relationality and then try to, and try to work through those things. I don't know if that helps, but that's, yeah, yeah. that's how I work. Yeah, uh, I really wanted to ask how possible is it to think about capitalism? without like slavery in the future. The, the answer might be very uh, easy to you, I don't know, but for me it's very hard, I'm grappling with it. And this is because I read um, one of the books, I think it's an amazing work, but different from like the work that I've, I'm used to. Uh, and that is, uh, it's called The Suicide of the Waste. It's written by Jonah Goldberg, so, uh, <laughs> editor of the National Review, so you, you, you could tell. But he tries to downplay the the role that slavery pl plays in the history of capitalism. And uh, that is something that I think intellectually concerning. 
So uh, I just wanted to pose that question to you. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's actually, I, I, I've gone around, I've made a career out of, of saying outrageous things, and, but the one that actually really seems to drive people crazy is that if you see, if you say that there's no capitalism without slavery, and then you say there's no capitalism without slavery, economists start coming to your talks, and they're crazy, you know, they're like, it, it makes, it drives them crazy. And, and I think that it's empirically the case. I, mean, I, just, don't, I just don't see how you could, other, you could argue otherwise. I just don't see how you could do it. So then, that, the question that that leads me to is, is, well, let's do some intellectual history of the effort to separate those things. And I think that's an intellectual history that goes well beyond the reaction to the, to the Williams thesis, I think that's an intellectual history that would take you to the very foundation of the notion of economic history, right? So why, why is it the case? Why is it an interesting question? Why is it interesting to say, well, um, I don't know, only 25% of the industrial capacity of Great Britain is focused on, at a particular moment in time, is focused on producing cotton, and there's another 25% that's produced, uh, focused on producing um, linen and linen is not an imperial um, crop and so what we can do is we can see that this might have happened industrialization and development might have happened on the basis of linen and other sorts of domestic non-imperial non-slave produced crops if we can just get rid of this 25 percent that has to do with slavery what kind of question is that mm -hmm. right that's a ridiculous way to think it's a bizarre way to think. And it seems like a regular way to think because we've all become inured to social science reasoning. So the question then is, well, where does this form of reasoning come from? And what does it have to do with derogating the role of African, African-American, and other imperialized people in the production of modernity? Right, so now, now that, that's a huge intellectual project that I don't have the, the chops to, to sort of do myself, but I actually think that that's there. I think that I, I, I would love to see that history. But, and Walter, can I just say, I think that that's it every, I mean, this book project that I'm very, very close to being finished with started with suddenly seeing that the, that the notion, like the people who are, who originate the idea of political arithmetic, right? Demography, the, and, and the scholarship on political economy that's happening in, that's organized around 17th century England. The men who are writing this are invested in the slave trade, and yet, his, you know, historians and political economists and political theorists treat them as completely distinct historiographical phenomena. So you have an enormous amount of scholarship on the economy of the slave trade and on, and on slavery in the 17th century, and then an enormous amount of, of scholarship on the history of political economy, and they're completely separate. They literally do not, I mean, and you can have a work on and, and it, this is terrible because this is a straw man, but um, uh, Mary Poovey's History of the Modern Fact, which is about the emergence of double entry bookkeeping and accounting practices that happens at the moment. And, and slavery doesn't even appear in the index of that work, right? And, and it's as if the question, like, how could that be? And so for me, I don't know how to answer that question because, again, as I keep on wanting to say, I'm not a historian of capitalism. I'm a historian of slavery. And so I only ever ask questions from the perspective of the history of, of, in, of slavery or enslavement. Um, but I, I, I find it, I, I don't find your statement at all uh, mm -hmm. provocative, Walter. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're, 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 we're on the same team. <laughs> we, we do have to, have to end. Sorry, Walter. <laughs> 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 we can give one last round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.